All right, it is July. I'm sorry, did it again? <laughs> August 8th. I cannot believe it's August. August 8th, 2021. It, it, I, yeah, we, we went and got shoes yesterday. And then the spirit Halloween thing already up too. And I'm like, already? And Noah's like, is it Halloween time? And Chloe's like, it's my birthday. I'm like, no, you got a couple months for that. She's like, but I saw the spirit Halloween thing. I go, no, it's going to it's gonna be a while. So, um, but yeah, they're already getting back going to school. Crazy times. Uh, I'm filling in for Russ today. Uh, we are going to spend a little time uh, on the subject matter of the rapture. Uh, I wanted to spend some time on this. I, I want to talk about these issues of the day of the Lord, comes as a thief in the night, I, you know, all the different verses that people are like, what does that mean? How do we know what that goes? And how do we take, you know, passages like Matthew, you know, 23, 24, and those other passages that say, take, take heed that no man deceive you, and then people are like, well, is the rapture just a new doctrine, and, and you guys just make this stuff up? And so I, I just hear constantly crazy <laughs> things about um, what people believe uh, in, in, as it relates to Scripture. But so... Uh, take your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. Uh, the Apostle Paul is going to discuss something that he calls a, uh, a, a mystery, you know, and, and this is a very interesting part uh, of, of the Scripture. Um, you know, there is a uh, long time throughout the Scripture in which nobody disagrees that there is a resurrection of some sorts, right? Um, even Martha herself and John chapter 10 says, you know, we know that there's going to be a resurrection at the last day and we shall all be raised up. Um, the apostle Paul in the book of Acts discusses the resurrection. He goes, listen, I was just speaking about all those things that they themselves also believe that there shall be a resurrection, both of the just and the unjust. He goes, they know that they believe that, right? So they, they get that. So what, 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 how do we take passage of scripture in terms of, you know, the, the Matthews passages that we'll look at in just a little bit that discuss the, the second coming of Christ and, and these verses where it specifically says, like, take heed that no man deceive you, and unless the following things come back, Christ is not going to return. And the say, like, this, is, this, is, this shouldn't be an issue. What, what, what is the issue with the rapture? Well, from a, from a perspective of uh, prophetical element, we know that prophetically speaking, right, prophetically speaking, there is a coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was never, I think, in the, in the mindset of the people that there would be two comings of Christ, right? So we use the term second coming. Guess what? That's not found in the what? Hey, we said that this morning. Verses, things that, are, that, things that we say that are not found in the Bible. Second coming, second coming. Isn't it interesting how we use that, right? But we, we don't realize that that phrase is not found in the scripture because we're going to show you throughout these this study we'll probably spend a couple weeks on this that there is multiple or there are multiple comings of the lord jesus christ throughout the scripture and when i first started this study i remember i said oh, i'm going to get this it's going to be easy i'm going to go through all these verses and i remember i got my i have the notepad or the document in my computer and i start typing in these verses and i start making this connection and then I'm printing stuff out, and I'm drawing the things, and I'm like, oh, this is going to be a lot more than I thought, <laughs> right? This is going to take me a little bit. And uh, I go back and forth to it every once in a while. Um, but let's, let's start with a couple of the, the Pauline epistles, because I think that's our best way to work our way backwards and show some of the differentiation between those passages and then what prophetically has been believed to be the standard of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and then the second coming that comes you know, after that, like they, like they believe. So go down to verse number 13 of chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, and the Apostle Paul makes the following statement. He says, But I would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep okay well first sleep is, a, is an interesting term that is used i have friends that believe truthfully that you're that you actually just sleep your soul sleeps your body sleeps it's just like you're sleeping and that there is no consciousness in the grave they go back and quote verses in you know the book of ezekiel and say there's no consciousness in the grave there's nothing no under, i'm sorry not conscious there's no understanding in the grave and therefore as a result of that you just you just you're in another region of sleep so just like you sleep you don't know time time doesn't pass by when you wake up, you wake up, and, and that will be the resurrection, and that's when you're going to be awakened up. So uh, Paul says, but I would not have you uh, ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Well, I just went to a funeral the other day, and I stared at the corpse inside the casket, and guess what? Looks like, looks like they're sleeping, you know? Just, they just sit there, and they're sleeping. They're, they're, not, they're not there. They're, they're, they don't exist in that body. They're somewhere else. They have, they have gone, right? Uh, throughout the scripture, we see a term about departing, right? 
dearly departed, right? The dearly departed. What does that mean? You see all those phrases we still see? We see them come around. But Paul wants you not to be ignorant concerning a specific issue. And this specific issue is a mystery, as he calls it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which we'll look at in just a minute. But he says, concerning them which are asleep. Now, you would think that this would be a fundamental, basic doctrine, right? Wouldn't you think so? We consider it a pretty fundamental, basic doctrine, the, the doctrine of the resurrection, the doctrine of you know, eternal life and, and, and being absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We, we think that to be fundamental. And here in Thessalonica, he specifically says that he does not want them to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. So obviously there were some people who did not know or did not understand this doctrine. I'll tell you why that's the case, because if you go back, we're not going to look at all these verses, I'm just going to talk. But in the book of Acts, you see when Paul is dealing with the Pharisees and Sadducees, and he's before Felix, and they're having this discussion, he goes, listen, dude, they're just mad at me because I'm talking about the resurrection of the dead. And when I start talking about them, that, that makes them accountable for the things that they're doing in this life, and then that makes Jesus still alive, which means that they still crucified him and killed him and have not believed on him. Therefore, they're waiting for the impending wrath of God to come upon them. However, you remember, the Sadducees stated what? That there is no resurrection. The Sadducees said there, there is no resurrection. And you go, well, it's just the Sadducees. They said there was no resurrection. Remember what they were also being told throughout 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. That the resurrection of the dead has already passed. That there is no resurrection. It's amazing because so much of Paul's epistles discusses, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. In other words, he's making you focus on the eternal perspective of, you know, your, your home in heaven. You know, he says, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter, number, um, for, or I, I, I'm I can't blanking on the, on the chapter here, but where he specifically says, you know, we know that if we're, you know, if we have a home built in heaven, 2 Corinthians, Corinthians 5. Um, uh, if we have a home, you know, we, we, we have a, a body that is currently home, but we're not really home, right? So the concept of being home or eventually being in where we should be or being in glory, right? Colossians, he says, he has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So what, 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 then, what then is the ignorant issue? Well, people were teaching. We see this, that in 1 Corinthians, they were teaching that the resurrection is already dead and they're overthrowing the faith of some. Just like people today teach that you soul sleep and then you're like, well, that sounds horrible. Why would I want to do that? <laughs> oh, wow. You know, uh, and we can show you throughout the scripture. You don't soul sleep. Luke 16 is a great verse. You don't soul sleep, right? You guys know Luke 16, right? The rich man, the rich man. Yeah. right? Um, you, can, you can talk about the, uh, you know, the, the criminal on the cross next to Christ, okay? I say, surely today you shall be with me in paradise. Well, what do you mean? I thought he was going to soul sleep, <laughs> right? Well, what, 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 what other verses could we go through? Well, Paul, you know, I was caught up into the heaven, and I saw things that are, that are not lawful for me to even utter. I mean, just crazy, crazy stuff. And I think that obviously incentivized him to continue on in his ministry. So we don't want to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Many people have died, you know, that, are, that have died in Christ, correct? Yeah, all the time. And uh, it's interesting for us as members of the body of Christ, whenever I go to a funeral of a believer, um, it's much different, <laughs> much different than a lost person. Very little crying. <laughs> hey, how's it going? Good to see you. Yeah, everything's great. Good. Yeah, terrific. Awesome. You know, start talking about your life, everything that's happening. And then you go to the funeral of the lost people and there's just wailing and gnashing of teeth and crying because they're what? They're, they're, they're lost. They're ignorant of, the, of the, you know, the hope that they have or that they could have had. So Paul says here, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not. This is really important because it's about the community aspect of the relationships that you make on earth and how they translate into a future. What's your, what's your life expectancy in the United States nowadays? 76? Something like that, right? It's, is it 93? looked at it the other day. No way. I have 30 more years. That sounds horrible. I do not want to live to 93. Mark my words. If I live to 93... I'm going for 93, man. You want to go 93? Yeah. Good Good luck. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I, I don't know what it is. But anyways, it's not that long. 
and the grand spectrum of eternity. So the connections that you make, the relationships that you make here on earth, it's pretty awesome to see that he's saying that you don't want to sorrow about the others who have fallen asleep in Christ Jesus. As if, and notice he says, as others which have no hope. So he's comparing that there's two groups of people. The one group of people, they sorrow because they have what? They have no hope. It's okay to cry at a funeral. I actually shed a tear at my, my friend's mom's funeral the other day. I'm not a super crier, but uh, the, the husband got up and was chatting and talking, and he was giving a good story, and it was pretty funny, and he got a little, it's always when somebody else gets choked up. He got choked up, and he's, a, you know, he's been a great mentor of mine for years, and he kind of like stopped for a second, and that's the worst part. You're like, oh man, you got to keep going, you know, and he's like, uh, you know, just all that horrible stuff, and you know, everybody's like, it's okay, take your time, just, you know, do what you got to do. So, but you know, that emotion that we have, uh, the hope that we get in it, we can cry and still have hope, right? I mean, you can still be sad about the carnal aspects of what we have in this flesh. But Paul says that they are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Paul in Romans chapter number 5 says that hope maketh not ashamed, right? Because why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, okay? So for us, our relationship with God in terms of being completely and fully reconciled, provides us with such peace. Oh, to be reconciled to God, right? Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Most individuals have no peace with God, and they know that, and therefore they're, they're looking for what? Paul says in Romans that they treasure up wrath, right? And to the day of wrath, and the righteous revelation of the judgment of God who will render to every man according to his works. Wow, right? So that doesn't sound very peaceful. It doesn't sound very hopeful. Um, but for us, using this phrase rapture, I had a friend ask me just the other day. He's not a believer. He's a big, you know, he's a kind of a country redneck kid. And he goes, hey, my girlfriend, he, she said, she said if, you, if you really buy a believing Christian, you, you, be, uh, you believe in a rapture? <laughs> and I go, what? He goes, yeah, like like people get taken up, and I'm like, uh, yeah. And he goes, what's that, honey? Oh, she wants she wants to know if you pre-trib, mid-trib, uh, uh, post-trib, seven-year. I don't know what she's asking. You want to talk to her? I'm like, no, I don't want to talk to her. But I mean, what are you asking me? And he, you know, this guy's not even a believer. He's he's dating and I'm uh, dating a believer, and she's asking all these crazy questions to me. Uh, not crazy, but you know, to him, crazy questions. So I had an opportunity. I kind of said, yeah, I believe in this and that. And so, you know what the 70th week is? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. And she's like, oh, she, so, so you really are a Bible-believing Christian or whatever is what his statement is from her, right? So we joked around for a little bit, and then I asked him a couple important questions about it. And he goes, I just, you know, I didn't really grow up in the church. I don't know anything about any of this. So relatively open, interested to hear, hear the information. But sometimes when you get into the issue of, you know, the rapture, people kind of go, wait, what? Right? My mom, when you walk into their house, she's got a, <laughs> she's got a book. It's on the left hand side when you walk after you walk you walk into the door, and it's a book and it says millions are missing. <laughs> Here's the answer. So she goes, well, I just figure I have this book here, so in case I disappear, you know, and uh, and it's interesting because I do want to have some time, <laughs> probably not today, but over the next couple weeks to talk to you about what might happen, okay. And, and this is really important because in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you know, the old belief is, and maybe you guys remember, I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head, there was that movie that was called Left Behind, the original one from like the 70s, right? <clears throat> and so in the, in the song, it was, uh, I wish we'd all been ready. Remember that? Yes. I wish we'd all been ready. Days grew cold. A piece of, a piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. Do you guys remember this, yes, please? Do. Does anybody remember this? That song? Oh, the song is like, it's in my head. And I sent it to my brother the other day, and I said, what do you, you remember this? My brother goes, wow. You know what the title of the album is from that song? So the song is, I wish we'd all been ready. And, and, I, and I'm, I'll actually, I'll, I want to make sure I'm quoting it exactly right, because I texted my brother it. I want to make sure I read it right. I still need to get glasses, my goodness. It was Larry Norman. I wish you'd all been ready. This is what he looks like, which is obviously, you know, I mean, man, he looks... Do you look like he's from the 70s or what? Yeah. Yes, he does. All day, all day long. <laughs> but his title of the album is Only Visiting This Planet. <laughs> Pretty interesting, right? 
But I know that movie had was a, was a uh, kind of a cult classic, very big hit. People watch, even unbelievers watch that they, you know, they, oh man, scared you. I remember the, the, the scene in the movie that I will never forget is when the girl is laying in bed, the husband gets up, goes in and shaves, and he's, he's got the plug-in shaver, shaving like that, and the, the girl's like, Jim, Jim, and walks in the room, and the razor is just in the sink. And then it's got this weird music, and it's like, dude, this thing's like pretty wacky, right? So as a kid, you watch that, and you're like, is this really gonna happen? Like, is this is this what is this what the Bible teaches? And to many, they get a little weirded out by it. So a couple questions. One is, do you think that God's gonna take our body? Because this is a point of point of contention that many people have. Some people believe that that Christ does that and actually take the body. He doesn't need your body. He'll leave it as a corpse. He'll leave it just on the ground. Mm-hmm. Okay. So there, there, and, and there's some scripture. There's some scripture that we can talk about that that could that could lead lead to that. I don't I don't think we could maybe say entirely conclusively exactly what occurs. But I do like how Paul says that we will not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Okay. So what does that changing process mean? Does he need your own flesh? How does he fashion that flesh? Okay. So could you imagine the craziness that now if it's not just millions are missing, <laughs> millions are just dead on the ground their, their corpses are everywhere you think that would create the the world to maybe take a second and step back and go oh my goodness we really yeah they'll be like covid covid 23 covid 23 is what really got all these people whatever it might be uh we're hoping by covid 30 we're, we got this we're out of here but you know anyways the 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 hope that we get from this is it can sometimes to people be a little bit wacky they might look at you and think this is crazy you have to kind of take a step back and really almost tell them, is anything not wacky? You know what I mean? It's, and I, I know that sounds, that sounds weird, right? But I'm almost saying, like, get out of the shower one day and just, you know, just look at yourself and go, this is crazy. Like, what am I doing? How is my hands moving, right? Just really get into the process. Oh, you got to eat some food? Where does that food come from, right? I'm not trying to make you just be a complete lunatic. I'm just trying to say you might want to just evaluate that a lot of things that happen, we don't have truly an explanation for, right? They can't, when we were discussing uh, the other day, anesthesia, my mom was getting her a surgery thing done and they did anesthesia and my mom was like, it's just so crazy, they don't know anything about it. I'm like, yeah, they don't know anything about it. They just know that it, it kills you, kind of, <laughs> you know? It's really what it does, it borderline just puts you under, but that consciousness, I'm serious, there's very little that they know and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a fine line, you know, uh, that propofil, when you've, you've ever had that, you know, it's like, crazy yeah. you just go like fight at 10 nine done right you wake up and you're like, but you wake up and it's like hold on that two hours just went by yeah. you're like how did that go right it's a good rest, it's a good rest. <laughs> so some people believe you know that there is a degree of of uh of sleep that happens in that regard and that that's what will occur and then you'll be you'll you're like just like you have the you, know, you go under it's that fast for the person you know you sleep and the, we're all conscious but those people they just wake up and they're there then there's a whole group of issue that 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 the resurrection doesn't all have to happen at the same time and that's a little wonky i don't know if i buy that one there's just a lot of different beliefs about this subject matter so it is a little bit of a point of contention but i think through careful study of the scripture we'll see that that the rapture of the church is a legitimate thing that happens in a pre-wrath and when i say wrath i mean any part of the tribulation i want to make that clear because people go are you a pre-wrath rapture well what does that mean well you mid 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 rapture mid we no 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 pre-wrath rapture they go well that's not really the wrath of god and i that we're going to look at those verses in other words they'll believe that you will be uh, uh raptured in the middle of the tribulation before the wrath of god is dispensed I don't believe that. I think the scripture is very clear. You have not been appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation, and that the wrath is all a part of the tribulation. And they call the wrath just a single day. It's the day of the Lord. Well, it's the days of the Lord. And we're going to talk about some verses in the book of Amos and, and uh, Joel and fun stuff. So anyways, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 13, uh, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, which I think everybody in this room believes, yes? yes? Okay. So we're part of the group, the we. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, 
them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring oh hold on hold on hold on he's going to bring them with him what do you mean See, when we think about the sleep, you know, they, they, you sleep in, in, in the grave, right? Have you ever seen the mummification process? Isn't it crazy? I mean, it's crazy that they have, they have bodies that they've mummified and they've, they've pulled out. And they're like, yeah, this thing is 800 years old or whatever the number is. And then the even crazier ones are when they find the ones of the little, like, Indians that they have, like, that are in the Eskimo Indians that are in the ice. And they pull them out and they're, like, literally, like, they look... It's insane, right? It's crazy that they have the, the, the body that's been so long it's been preserved, right? So I think about it like this. You know, when he brings them with him, what's he going to do? This is important, okay? Does he bring back their bodies with him? What's he bringing with them? He's not bringing back their bodies. Their bodies are in the ground. What is he bringing with them? Okay, so... Why would he bring them with him? What's the what's the concept or the purpose behind coming together and bringing them together? Well, leaves the uncleanness behind. Well, isn't it exciting to see your friends? Don't you get excited when somebody comes over? Mm-hmm. Isn't it gonna be very exciting for you to see if you were still alive at the point of the ter- time of the of the rapture, where you would see individuals who you knew? Wow, maybe people that you haven't seen in a long, long time who are also dead in Christ, would that not just give you not only seeing Christ, but then you're also seeing all these people who are also, you know, members of the body of Christ for, I mean, I could think about tons. I mean, I have hundreds of people that I know that have died over the years, and I'm young, and my dad always says, just wait. He's like, just wait. He's like, you hit like 50, and it's like, they just start dropping like flies. Yeah, here, Jim died, and then my neighbor the day we were talking about it, and he goes, yeah, I was just reading the paper. I was like, what are you reading the paper? You obituaries. <laughs> I go, why? He goes, I just see so many people I know that just die. Oh, I knew Jim. I knew Billy. I knew Susie. Just reads the obits every day and, and just seeing all the people that die. So, you know, the hope that we have is not in, in death. I mean, we don't, we don't even care about that. That's, you know, death is just a, it's a, it's a formality that we have to go through. Russ always says, I'm not scared of dying. I'm scared about how I'm going to die. He's like, just take me quickly. <laughs> no, pain. no pain, please. Don't, don't like... Get me, uh, you know, in the Titanic, and then I gotta sit there and you know, don't let my boat explode. And I'm just treading water for, you know, 20 hours. I'm just like, oh, this is horrible, Shark right? Gets you. Shark gets me, right? So if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also, which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? Bring with him where? Where is he gonna bring him? Well, notice he says, for this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Interesting verse, right? So this is getting into the order of the resurrection. He kind of is talking about what's going to happen. So we talk about order of resurrection in the sense of what bodies will be resurrected at what point in some time. And this is a lot. The bodies that get resurrected, you have to keep in mind that there is a, a very detailed prophetical element that has to be fulfilled, right? And I'll give you a prime example. Let's take the 144,000. Where do you think those people come from? How are you going to find 144,000 Jewish male virgins today from different tribes? I'd love to answer that question. Somebody find me how you're going to find those guys. How do you know what tribe they're from, where they are? How can we find the delineation of that? Perhaps is a potentiality that they are resurrected. So there's a lot of information that we need to go through, and you can see, if you remember this, remember, remember, at, 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 in, um, when when Christ is sitting there and he brings uh, uh, Peter, James, and John, and he shows them Moses and Elijah, right? Yes. He sees them, right? And he's like, "Oh my goodness!" And they said, "He says, what does he say? This is a good thing." Now, the real question I want to know about that is, how does he know? who Moses and Elijah are. Because he's never met them. Thousands of years go by. So how does he recognize them? I think it's the issue that when you're in that presence area, the sin doesn't clout your mind. I'm getting to a point now where I forget things. I seriously, my friend's mom the other day, she comes to Keswick, we're talking, 
she's talking to me, and I'm looking at her and her husband, and I have no clue what their names are. And I'm like, I'm just talking to her, and, I'm, and she's giving me a hug. How's it going? So good to see you. I've known the lady for 20 years. And I'm just staring at her, and I'm like, Meredith? Mary? Um, uh, Julie? And I just I couldn't remember it for the life of me. And then the husband came up. And he's like, hey, Jason, how's it going? I'm like, hey, dude, what's up? I'm like, I don't remember your name either. And I really felt like, I don't know what it was. I don't normally have that, but I had like this mental block of, of not understanding. I do think that some of that, as you get older, of course, gets worse, I'm, I've been told. But then think about not having that mental block and just being able to have purity of thought where there's no, no carnal issue, there's no, no, no depression, there's no sadness, there's no anxiety, there's nothing. And you, just, you can just, oh, yeah, I know, all, you can just you see it. And I think that that removal and God allows us to, you know, he'll, you're not going to have to be introduced to the Apostle Paul. You'll walk right up to him and you'll go, yeah, you're Paul. I know exactly who you are. I have no question in my mind, right? That's, that's who you are, right? So we see that, and that, that should give us a hope that those individuals, you know, it's not just like an apparition. It wasn't like just some, some you know, holographic thing that God did. He allowed them to see what they're currently doing in the spiritual realm, right? Um, this is a little off topic. We're going to just go here because it's really interesting. There is a very famous drug. It's called DMT. And uh, people, I don't know, some of you guys may have heard about it, um, but it's a very interesting hallucinogenic type of drug. And the I- issue that people a lot of times say is they have a spiritual awakening, like ayahuasca, which is another type of you know, spiritual drug that the Indians used to do. And you got to go to South America and do all this stuff. But wh- why I'm saying that is that so many of those people that have the spiritual awakening through that process, though they don't usually find Christ, they come away going, there is a spiritual realm. Like, we see it. And Paul is very clear that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and thrones and min- dominions and mights, right? And spiritual wickedness in high places. I mean, where are they at? What are they doing? There's a whole aspect of what goes on, right? When the angels come to Christ and minister unto them, it wasn't a, necessarily a visible aspect of what goes on, right? It's, it's, a, it's a spiritual realm. So to me, I like that a little bit because it's something to look forward to. It's that hope. It's like, okay, yeah, this is kind of cool. I like that. That's That's... I can, I can picture that in my mind, but I can't, you know, like how Paul says, we don't see clearly. We look through a glass darkly, right? We can't, we can't fully comprehend what that's going to be like. And I think a lot of these passages, we can't fully comprehend what that's going to be like. When you say, yeah, you're going to get your glorified body, I'm sorry, you can't even begin to understand what that means. We can just say, yeah, we believe that, but, you know, Laura's over there getting hips done, you know? You know, I mean, you're not going to be getting hips done in your new body. And it's going to be, it's going to be fashioned like after his glorious body, and it's going to be great. I mean, I, I, I have, you know, for being 36 years old, I mean, I got more back pain than ugh, most people. And I, I wake up and go, I, t- I called Todd yesterday, and I said, do you wake up every day and you're just so stiff? He goes, Jason, because he played, you know, football for FSU. He says, Jason, I wake up every day and I go, how am I going to even function today? I'm going to move, you know? Like, just you just get out of bed. That's how I do. I get out of bed and I go, Oh, Lord. It's the first hour of every day. Just, just trying to get, okay, is it going to pop? Is it going to move? Oh, is today going to be one of those days where I just feel like I can't breathe? Is it going to be, you know, I just kind of, yeah, I'm in my 30s. Oh, I have trauma, trauma, smashing my head, concussions, you know, biking accidents, surfing accidents, skimboarding accidents, soccer falls. I mean, just think about all the things I've done, and I'm just like over and over and over and over again. I just know. Yeah, I have for, for being in any of my friends that play football. Listen, you play football. The amount of hits that they get in one season is more falls than you've ever had in your entire life. You take a really bad fall one time and you fall hard. I'm talking where you fall and you see stars a little bit. That messes with you, you know. And I've had, I can't even tell you how many of those I've had where I got up and I'm like, what, what day is today? You know, I don't even know what's going on. My brain hurts, right? So I say that to go get into this issue of the hope that we have. And the, and the issue that we can't necessarily comprehend how good it's going to be. But I like to think about it like this. I remember being a little kid, and Noah, I always ask him, does your back hurt? He goes, no. I say, do you have any pain in your body right now? He goes, no. And I go, it's going to kind of be like that, right? I go, nothing hurts on you? He goes, nope. Like your rib doesn't hurt over here. You know, like your hip flexor. No, no, everything feels good. I mean, that kid is just like, you know, like a, he's like Gumby, you know? It's just, it's amazing. But that's kind of how I think about it. I'm like, okay, 
So that, that the, the de degeneration, if you would, uh, and then our regeneration in that new body is something to, to look forward to, obviously, a lot. Paul says that uh, it's not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, for this, call, for this we say in verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain. Okay. Who's alive and still remains on the earth? How many of those people are? Some people teach, and I'm just, I'm throwing this out there. I don't like, I don't normally do this, but this is such a contest, some, a pretty contested method. I usually don't tell you what other people believe. I usually just preach the word. But in this particular verse, I think it's good to be aware of what somebody might say about it so that you're not going, oh, I didn't really think about that. Some people think that we're alive and remain. They say, yeah, you made it through the tribulation. You got to the very end and that you're the last remaining people left on the planet, right? Listen. This, the, 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 there's just, are there few that be saved? The answer is yes. So there's going to be fewer and fewer people who believe the gospel as time comes on. So we which are alive remain under the coming of the Lord shall not, as he uses this word, prevent them which are asleep. So, well, how, how are we going to prevent them? Is there somehow we get in the way? Like we all have to die first and then we can, we, you see how he's saying this? He's saying, you don't have to die. That's the whole purpose here. We're not going to prevent them until are asleep, meaning the people that are sleeping are waiting for us to all die. Got it? That's what he's saying. Hurry up and die, guys. Hurry up, everybody. Let's all just die. Then we can all get resurrected. Because once we all die, he's saying, no, no, no. It's not going to prevent them. So now from a timeline perspective, at what point in time is this occurring? Right? Because he doesn't really tell you a time. He just says that, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive remain under the coming of the Lord. He says when that comes, we're not going to prevent them which are asleep. He's going to come when he wants to come. When is that? Well, he says over here in verse number, uh, if you go back to chapter 3. Oh, man, actually, let's go back to, uh, yeah, we'll look at 3 first. Look at 3 in verse number uh, 13. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with what? So he already told you that he's coming with all of his saints. Then he also tells you back, if you go back a little bit longer, to go back to chapter 2 in verse number 18, he says, uh, 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 for wherefore we would have come uh, uh, come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of we rejoicing? Okay, I want you to think about this. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? I told you in the beginning that when you when you have a reconvening with somebody you haven't seen in a super long time, it's amazing, right? You're like, wow, I haven't seen you in so long, especially when it's a close friend, right? Like you just you get so excited and you. I haven't seen you in so long. I tell people all the time, you know, you're, you know, nowadays with all this Facebook junk, like, you know what everybody's doing. It's not like the old days. You'd see them and you go, I haven't seen you in so long. Tell me about your life. And you guys could sit down there forever. Now you could be like, yeah, I've already been following you on Facebook. I've seen everything you've done. I saw all your stuff. And we really have nothing to talk about, right? <laughs> but he says, our hope, his joy, and his crown of rejoicing he says, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? You see how much this book is about the coming of Christ? He's telling you again here that, that you are his hope, his joy, and his crown of rejoicing, and that ye will be in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. For he says, for ye are our glory and joy. You're not just excited. Notice this. This is super important. You get nothing else, just get this. Eternality exists in people are eternal. You can not only look forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but you can look forward to the coming of all of his saints with him. In other words, start thinking about the concept of, wow, all of these friends and relatives and other members of the body of Christ who have died before us, who are asleep in Christ Jesus, that Christ will bring with them. Think you're going to get a little more excited? And then let me just ask you this. If he's coming just to execute a bunch of wrath on the world, why is he bringing all the saints? What's, what's the deal there? 
The whole purpose of him bringing all those saints is for you. That's what he's telling you. He says, for what is our hope or our joy or our crown of rejoicing? You see this? See how it's not just, oh, the second coming of Christ? How about the second coming of all your friends? <laughs> it's not the second coming. It's the, it's the coming of Christ with all your friends. Okay? How many people have never heard that before? Seriously. That, that, you, that he comes with all your friends. It, it, it's, it's, isn't it amazing the stuff that you just, you go, oh, I, I've read this passage, I've read this before, I just never put two and two together, right? It's interesting to say, he says, sleeping Jesus, will God bring with him? He's going to bring him with him. It's exciting stuff, is it not? Doesn't that give you like, wow, it's hope, that's like great, it's awesome. Because I have a lot of friends. I mean, I told you, I've had, I've had, two, I had two friends OD last year and had a friend get murdered last year. So literally, murder and two ODs. Ah pretty brutal for people all under the age of 40 right I know for a fact 100% two of them were 100% believers the other I, I don't know but two one was a very the kid that was murdered was, a, was like my mentor as a kid growing up like taught me to play soccer showed me how to play Nintendo and Zelda and all this stuff you know it's cool I mean I look at it as like you know people are like oh isn't that sad I'm like eh, it's sad but not for, not for him <laughs> you know I mean he, he, he you know he got run over his what is literally his, his crazy girl ran him over with a truck crazy right I mean you think he woke up that day and said I can't wait to just get run over by the truck and get killed no he's got three I think if not four kids you know I mean so stuff stuff like that happens and it's uh and and so you get I look forward to seeing him again one day and so I look at it from a temporary issue it's always temporary you know they teach you in counseling all the time all your problems are just temporary I go but are they if you're not in Christ? Because <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're permanent problems, and you don't have any you don't have any escape. I always wonder how non-Christian counseling goes. What do they What do they tell you? What, they, what kind of hope are you going to give me? It's going to be a little less sucky tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, yeah, here's another jug. A little, little less sucky tomorrow, and here's another jug. We're not going to teach you how to change your mindset or teach you anything about the gospel or eternal life, but man, we can. We can sure teach you about how, you know, how we can, you know, pop you, pop you pills and numb you down to make you feel a little better. And I, I, I'm careful to say I, I'm not against, you know, medication in certain situations, okay? I, I know people who have, who have needed it at points and times in their life, and that's fine. I have no problem with that. But I will say is that, you know, this, these verses, this truth here is so unbelievable to the world that they just won't believe it, you know? Paul says specifically why they don't believe it. Why? Satan hath blinded their minds, right? Unless they should believe the light of the glorious gospel. So for what is our hope or what is our joy or what is our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Do you want to help build your heavenly family? Yeah. So why do we take, why do we just neglect it so much? Why do we just, ah, it's so difficult. I don't want to have those tough conversations. I sit there so many times and I look at some of my buddies who I, I know are just complete atheists and I'm just like, you know, I've told you the gospel. You just don't want to believe it. Do I need to do it again? And I go, yeah, I probably should just do it again. You know, just do it again. And, and just staying on that path of knowing that, hey, I'm just going to keep playing. I'm just going to keep watering. I'm just going to keep playing. I'm just going to keep watering. Because I do want, at the coming of Christ, to have more joy. Paul says it. What is our hope? What is our joy? What is our crown of rejoicing? Are not ye even in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ? Paul goes on to say in verse number 15 of chapter 4, for we say then, we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. This is super important. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, this is the fun part for those that believe in soul sleep. Guys, he's going to bring, in verse 13 of chapter 3, he says he's going to, at the coming of the Lord Jesus with all his saints. And then he says it. He says he's going to, you know, are you not a crown of rejoicing? Are you not in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? He has to be but he said he wasn't going to be here for a minute. Okay, we're good. We'll, we got three minutes and we'll close. I just want to finish this out. I, 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 honestly, if you were to ask me how many minutes I preached, I'd probably say like 12. It's been 40, okay? He says, he says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, when he says the dead in Christ shall rise first, are the dead in Christ dead as in they're just sleeping and they're there? 
this whole issue is they need their bodies. See how this works? They want their glorified body. That's the first Corinthians chapter number 15. That's when he unites and gives them that new spiritual body. See how that works? We're going to... We have so much to talk about this from a timeline perspective because so many people go, when is the judgment seat of Christ? Where does that happen, right, in the spectrum of this process right here? Yeah, we can, we're going to go over that. The Lord himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, notice what he says, shall be caught up. Okay. We're going to go over some verses where he says that he's going to come and your feet are going to be on the Mount of Olives. And you're going to be standing there waiting. You're going to see him. Then he's going to put his feet on the Mount of Olives. And he's going to establish his kingdom and his throne. So is that this? He also says he's going to come and he's going to gather from the four winds his elect. Is that this? He's got another verse where he says that he's going to gather all the wicked, all the tares out of the field, and he's going to take them for judgment. Is that this? I'm going to tell you right now. There are multiple raptures in your Bible. I told it someone one time, they look at me and go, no, there's not. I'm like, yeah, yeah, there's, there's at least four. And they're like, wait, what? I'm like, yeah, there's, there's multiple catchings up. We're multiple takings away, right? In that song, he says, you know, uh, you know, it says the man and wife asleep in bed. When he hears a noise and turns her head, he's gone, right? I wish we'd all been ready. Two are walking up a hill. Uh, whatever he says, turns the head again. He's, the, the other's left standing still is what he says is the lyric, right? So they're gone. So is that is that the rapture? Is that what's going on? He, he's They're using verses from Matthew, and they're trying to equate that back entirely to the rapture. And it's, it's interesting because you can't really do that. It doesn't really work out. And that's when you pigeonhole these verses, and you try to make things work, and you go, huh? Huh? Right? So we'll look at who was left behind in all those pieces. Let's just finish out this verse and we'll pick it out. He says, Then we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with them. Who was the them? All of his saints at his coming. Those that are in his presence. He says, specifically says, that you will be caught up together. Well, yeah, I love to be together. Scripture says, It is not good for man to be alone. I can attest that that is a true statement. You really, community is so important. Friendships are so important. I'm not even saying romantic relationships. Friendships are so important in life. You know, I talk to so many people about, oh, I'm so depressed and my life is so miserable and so horrible. And I said, it's because you're very selfish. And you spend far too much time on yourself. And they look at me and go, really? I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Take your day when you're feeling like you're the saddest, most depressed person on the planet and go do something for somebody else. And I promise you, you'll go, wow, my life, I, I just, I, there's so much more fulfilling in my life. Oh, yeah, because you're not selfish anymore. We can be selfish about these verses, though. We should be really selfish about this. We should want every single person we know to be together with us at this time. And we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're meeting him in the air. Is he coming down? Is he going back up? That's the question. We're going to pick that up next week. Verse 18 says this. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. If that doesn't make you just go, huh, I got a lot of comfort. I, I just want to lay my head on a little pillow and just, just that's, that's what it feels like to me. When I read those verses, it's like a little pillow. I just nuzzle up, put my head on it and go, yeah, I'm good. Oh, the world's going the hell in a handbasket? <laughs> COVID's killing the whole world, allegedly. Whatever's going on, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You know, which one of you by taking thought for the morrow can have one cubit under your stature? You can't. So don't bother worrying about it. It ain't going to change it. Let's close the pearl pickup next week.